What's up, you beautiful bastards? Hope you've had a fantastic Wednesday. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show, and let's just jump into it. And the first thing we're gonna talk about today is a story that has just blown up over the past 24, 36 hours that, that, that hits on a few things, right? Trustworthiness, mob mentality, actually trying to call something out versus something that's just a hit piece. And the situation we're talking about is this controversy and scandal that has popped up around Coors Gazette and its founder, Philip Detmer. And if you're not already familiar with Philip's channel, it's a very popular science channel, has over eight million subscribers. They're best known for their In a Nutshell videos, which take complex topics, they try to break it down into more digestible pieces. We've even included them on Today and Also. And the reason the spotlight is on Philip is that yesterday a channel called Coffee Break, which is run by a guy named Steven, released a video where in the thumbnail he claims that Philip is lying. And in this video, in part, he talks about his experience where he communicated with Philip Detmer. And the way that I'm gonna try and cover this story is to include parts of the original accusations and the original video, as well as counterpoints from Philip and things that have come out afterwards, as well as things that didn't seem to be touched on. So, Steven starts off his video like this. Can you trust Kurt Gazart videos? No. And ironically, the reason you can't trust them is that this video exists at all. He goes on to say that he's working on a series about the pop science genre, how the simplification of complicated topics can lead to misinformation. He then specifically cites a TED talk by Johan Hari called Everything You Know About Addiction Is Wrong, as well as Philip's 2015 adaptation of the TED talk called Addiction. Steven says he reached out to Johan and Philip to talk about the video and ask questions about the errors in it. Steven said Philip responded almost immediately and requested not to be quoted. And so in that video, Steven only shares his half of the emails and gives kind of vague summaries of Philip's responses. But after the coffee break video was uploaded, Philip started an AMA on Reddit so people could ask him questions regarding the video. And in that thread, one of the first things Philip did was he authorized the release of his half of the emails, which Steven uploaded to Imgur. And so now that we have all the emails and more of Philip's side from the AMA, let's break it all down. Also, a quick note, the horror music or the evil things are happening music, that is not from us, that is from Steven's video. Steven shows his first email to Philip. On February 2nd, I emailed him, I have some tough questions about the video on addiction that Kurtz Gazette did. It's one of your most popular videos. I'm worried that some of the major claims in that video are vastly oversimplified if not outright incorrect. Did Kurtz Kozat conduct an independent fact-checking of Johan Hari's book before agreeing to this? He then goes on to paraphrase Philip's first email in response. Philip responds on February 2nd. Essentially, he's not thrilled about the interview or video idea. He was worried that the video might be a call-out. He basically says, hey, the addiction video wasn't perfect, but I feel it was good enough. And then he asks, what is your video all about? But in the actual email, Philip doesn't really seem to say that. In fact, he directly says he would not make a video like that today for obvious reasons. He acknowledges that it's not difficult to find critique of Hari's work nowadays, but that it wasn't as common when the video was made. He then goes on to say that he received countless messages from people who told him the video helped them, and so he couldn't bring himself to take it down. And he concludes that email at the time by saying that while addiction is a complicated topic, he believes the video can exist as a helpful opinion. It's also important to note the criticisms of Hari here as well. Hari's argument was that addiction is largely psychological and not chemical, a theory that has received pushback from many experts. There, he asked if Philip was aware of the public scandal Hari had that threw his credibility into question. And for some background there, the scandal Philip was referring to was back in 2011 when Hari was accused of plagiarizing other journalists' work and then anonymously editing Wikipedia pages to discredit people who criticized him. Steven then goes on to describe the next two email interactions with Philip. I share with him my idea and some of the questions and criticisms I had, and he replied to me that he would be interested in doing an interview, provided I wait. He was busy traveling and told me to wait till early March before we could do the interview. Now, let's talk about what's in these two emails that aren't said in the video. Steven does explain his project, but he also challenges Philip's claim that criticisms of Hari's work weren't available at that time, saying there are problems with Hari's work, not just looking back from 2019, but holes in his research that were easily available at the time. To which Philip responded that he did confront Hari about the critique, but he wasn't comfortable discussing it with Steven. This seemingly because he thought Steven's project was a gotcha video. Then after showing the email, Steven launches into the main accusations he's making. In March 3rd was the day I found out what Philip had been really busy doing, too busy to answer my questions. He had been busy making my video for me, for his channel. He even did me the favor and interviewed himself by answering all my questions. Steven goes on to show clips from the video and how they correspond with the questions in his emails. He asked if they independently fact-checked Hari's book and he shows this clip. Unfortunately, we did not reach out to scientists or do extra research on the papers that were the basis for the video's thesis. He then goes on to show clips from the video where it talks about oversimplification and how it can be distorting. And he gives us a brief clip where they say they deleted the addiction video. So today, we deleted them. But then if you watch the full video that was posted, they actually go in depth explaining how they do their research, how they the process has evolved over time. It's also not just about one video. But it would be dishonest to say that we've always worked this way. Some older videos don't live up to the standards we set ourselves today. The two that annoy us the most are the refugee and addiction videos. But we never made anything like them again and have been discussing how to deal with them for a long time. It doesn't help that both videos are loved by many people. We want to be proud of our work 
and these two videos don't make us proud. So today, we deleted them. Stephen then accuses Philip of preempting his own research and stalling the interview so he could get ahead of the criticism. He says it's unfair for larger creators to steal content from smaller creators, which is how he's characterizing Philip addressing the issues from their past. He also goes on to say that there is no way this could be a coincidence. Firstly, he never once mentions to me that he had a video response in the works about the exact topic I was emailing him about. He then also reiterates that Philip seemed happy with the video being good enough and didn't want to take it down. In his emails with me, he seemed happy with the addiction video and didn't want to take it down. Essentially, he knew the video was incorrect, but he said he felt it was good enough to keep up anyway. However, Philip refutes this in the AMA. When asked if he removed the addiction video because of the coffee break video, Philip says that he had been working on a script regarding the addiction video and removing it for two years. Responding, it was absolutely one motivation for it, but I've been writing this script for the better part of two years, so it was not like we did it just because of him. And this is a claim that was also backed by another massive creator by the name of CGP Grey, who says that Philip had been talking about this for essentially two years. And when asked why he didn't tell Steven he was working on a video like this, he said he didn't want to give him more information because he felt Steven's video was going to be a hostile takedown. Then, Steven talks about Johan Hari and gives us a clip. The addiction video was based on only one source that has amassed a lot of criticism over the years. That addiction is purely psychological and based on the life circumstances of the individual. Steven explains that Hari doesn't believe that addiction is purely psychological and that the idea was only a simplification that came from condensing his book into a 15 minute TED talk. He says if you look at Hari's book and any interview he's done, he doesn't actually hold such a simplified view. So because of this, Steven says that it is clear that Philip never read Hari's book. He then goes on to play a clip of a phone conversation he had with Hari where he essentially says no one believes that addiction is purely environmental or purely chemical, and he accuses Philip of scapegoating Hari and portraying him as crazy, but Philip refutes this as well. When asked if he did read Hari's book, Philip said, of course I did. After reading it, I very enthusiastically emailed him and asked him to collaborate on the video. Continuing, yeah, he wrote most of the script, which is the reason why it has such a big overlap with his TED talk. And Philip's claim that Hari largely wrote the script is an important segue to the last thing that we're going to talk about, which is that there were two emails that Stephen really didn't talk about in his video. In the last of Steven's emails that he released, he says that he spoke to Hari and that his story changed considerably after their conversation, which makes sense as to why he starts defending Hari's work later in the video and doesn't discuss the controversies he claimed discredit Hari and prove that his work could be considered false information. This despite the fact that the discussion of the factual basis of Hari's work was a huge talking point in the emails between Steven and Philip. But it's the final email that we see that makes me personally not trust Steven. The final email in this exchange actually comes from Philip on February 21st. And in that email, he asks Steven to send him questions and he tells Steven he can talk with him next week. And it was Steven who never responded to Philip's email asking him for questions or to try to schedule the interview. A fact that Steven admitted to in a Reddit thread where he tried to explain why he didn't, saying the reason I didn't reply immediately is one, I was polishing a video about comedy, and two, I was going to follow up after a trip in Lake Tahoe, adding, if I had known I should be in a hurry, I would have been. Nothing suggested that. It seemed like something we were going to work out over a few weeks. And then two weeks after that email that Philip sent out that Steven didn't respond to, Philip put out a video where he talked about the past video. So if Steven during that time couldn't be troubled to respond back to Philip, this person that he was trying to get information out of. Couldn't be troubled to respond. How is that landing on Philip's head? Also, I think it's interesting that Stephen says that Philip, you know, he, he was he was stalling, seemingly in reference to Philip being busy with VidCon, Educon, and what appears to be rest after chemo. And so ultimately, to me, this situation looks very much like you, you have someone, Stephen, who is very angry and bitter that the target of his hit piece talked about the things in his past before he could. Because he decided to address this thing that if you looked into the comment section on those videos before they were removed. People had a lot of the same complaints and callouts that you had way before you. But because you hit on those same points and same questions, obviously it's something nefarious with Philip. No, to me, this seems like another example of a mid-tier YouTuber trying to generate mob mentality and a lot of anger to take down someone bigger to pull in their own new subscribers. As far as if there was malicious intent from the get-go, I don't know. I feel like Steven may be feeling like he was screwed over, messed with his bias and his ability to work on something objectively. But it's really troubling to me because if Philip wasn't so quick to respond to this video with an AMA, just being very transparent, yes, release all the emails, Emails. I'm gonna respond to as many people as possible. This paraphrased version of the situation that Steven put out there, that could have spread even further. And one thing I know from personal experience on both ends of it is, ooh, once there is blood in the water, people will strike. And in a lot of different situations, very unfortunately for the person being accused, truth doesn't matter. And I personally find it very funny that, that Steven, and one of his criticisms is that when you're trying to simplify something, right, make it more consumable, that that can lead to misinformation. And here, 
We are. And actually, I have a note here. Phillips sent me a statement saying, I didn't stall him with malice in mind, but I also didn't motivate him to work faster. Of course, I wanted to have the first word on my own failings. I've been working on and off on the video since early 2017, which made it extra frustrating. So I decided to finish the video and release it. It felt like the right thing to do. I never would have thought that he'd go this far and purposefully misrepresented our email conversation. It is sad this whole thing happened. I really would have done the interview with him. And adding, I said anything else that is relevant in the AMA in our sub. Oh, and since one of the last things Steven, AKA Coffee Break, did in his video was to kind of like cast doubt or discredit anyone that's even remotely attached to Philip, saying he co-owns the smart YouTube mafia. Also in other places online, saying those people have a COI, a conflict of interest. One of the reasons I wanted to cover this story is I have no personal connection to Philip. We include him in TIA, but honestly, if his company went to hell, the whole thing burnt down wouldn't change anything for me. And so that's why I felt the need to do what Steven said to do at the end of his video. Please say something, speak out. So I did. And also to co-op that last line, be sure to share this video because you know, one of the unfortunate realities of the internet is the big claim usually gets a lot more traction than the reality of the situation. And as someone that hasn't gotten it right every single time, one, I think it's important that we don't villainize people who go back, they look at what they've done, whether it be a long time ago or something recently and they go, you know what? I evolved or I didn't look at the whole situation. I got things wrong. That's not up to my standards and they, and they fix it. If we do that, we incentivize people to double down on the wrong. And if you're expecting perfection from anyone that you consume content from, you will just eventually be disappointed. That is a guarantee. And two, I think it's important that when we realize a situation is not completely as it appeared to be in the beginning, we get the word out on the other side, the reality of the situation. What are the differences? But with that said, that's where I'm gonna end this story. That's, that's the story as I've seen all the facts, my personal takeaway from it. And of course I pass the question off to you. What are your thoughts around this? Who's in the right? Who's in the wrong? Do you see this as misrepresentation, trying to get mob mentality to boost you? Any and all thoughts, I'd love to hear from you in those comments down below. But from that, I wanna share some stuff I love today and today in awesome, brought to you by Postmates and postafranco.com. And Postmates, if you don't know, is the fantastic delivery on demand service. You want something from the store, your favorite restaurant, you wanna snag some drinks for yourself or the party or whatever. All you've gotta do is open up the app, put in your order and boom, they will deliver it to where you live, where you work, wherever. It is by far one of my favorite apps because it saves me that time that I'd otherwise have to go out there and interact with people I don't wanna have to. And I can use that time to be either more productive or just do nothing, which is, oh, that's the dream, isn't it? More and more, that's my personal dream. But best of all, if you download the app, which you can click the link in the description down below, you can go to posttofranco.com, make sure you enter in code Philly D, because when you do that, Postmates will give you $100 in free delivery fee credit. And the first bit of awesome today is actually a congratulations. Congratulations to the two winners of our email sign up for Beautiful Bastard. Be sure to check your email, your spam folder, we're reaching out so we can give you some free product. And to everyone else who's been going to Beautiful Bastard, Com, buying all the products, sending us this. I love you guys sending us tweets and pictures of you getting the product, using Keep it. Keep doing it because I love that you guys love it as much as I do. Although I do get annoyed that some of you look better with it. But enough about my low self-esteem. Then we had two chains showing off his insane jewelry collection. We got a trailer for Long Shot. We had Troy Savon exploring ASMR. We had Tier Zoo asking and answering our Dolphins OP. We had Dude Perfect giving us airplane trick shots too. We had Oscar Isaac and Pedro Pascal answering the web's most searched questions. And if you want to see the full versions of everything I just shared, the secret link of the day, really anything at all. Links as always are in the description down below. And then, oh wow, oh wow, oh wow, let's talk about this insane story that dropped yesterday. If you didn't see yesterday, the Department of Justice indicted 50 people, including TV stars and other prominent wealthy figures for participating in a bribery scam to get students into elite colleges. And of those indicted, 33 are parents of high school students who paid anywhere from $15,000 to $500,000 to get their children into colleges. With Andrew Lelling, a US attorney, calling the parents involved a catalog of wealth and privilege. But it wasn't just limited to parents, Others indicted included college coaches, exam proctors, and college administrators. And reportedly, the colleges targeted by this scam included Yale, UCLA, the University of Southern California, Stanford, and Georgetown, among others. The indictment states that the scam started back in 2011, and the FBI dubbed their investigation into this Operation Varsity Blues. I feel like Billy Bob would rate that name a 10. A 10! A fucking 10! But reportedly, the man behind the operation is William Rick Singer, who owned a business called Edge College and Career Network, and he created a nonprofit that he called the Key Worldwide Foundation. And reportedly, parents would pay him with money that was marked as charitable donations to cheat on the child's SAT or ACT scores or to use connections to Division I athletics to fake their child as a sports recruit regardless of whether or not their child actually played sports. According to the indictment, he described what he did as making a side door into college admissions. On a phone call, he reportedly said, okay, so who we are, what we do is we help the wealthiest families in the U.S. get their kids into school. There is a front door, which means you get in on your own. The back door is through institutional advancement, which is 10 times as much money. And I've created this side door in because the back door, when you go through institutional advancement, as you know, 
everybody's got a friend of a friend who knows somebody who knows somebody, but there's no guarantee. Wow, this just sounds like all my dad's friends who just ran really sketchy scams. Like this sounds like a thing that comes from someone named Rick Singer. But he goes on to say, they're just gonna give you a second look. My families want a guarantee. So if you said to me, here's our grades, here's our scores, here's our ability, and we want to go to X school, and you give me one or two schools, and then I'll go after those schools and try to get a guarantee done. And Singer allegedly made $25 million from all of this. But in not happy fun time news for him, he was charged with racketeering, money laundering, tax evasion, and obstruction of justice. And just yesterday, he pleaded guilty to those counts. So how exactly did these scams work? Well, it actually gets pretty complicated. So to break it down, we're gonna start with cheating on the entrance exam. According to the indictment, Singer would do this by bribing college entrance exam administrators to allow a third party to facilitate cheating on college entrance exams. In some cases, by posing as the actual students and in others by providing students with answers during the exams or by correcting their answers after they had completed the exams. And parents would pay anywhere from $15,000 to $75,000 per test. And they would also say that their child had a learning disability so they could take the test privately either in West Hollywood or Houston in centers that Singer claimed to have control of. And as far as that third party hired to take the exam, reportedly that was a man named Mark Rydell. Rydell is a director of college exam preparation at IMG Academy in Florida, although he has been suspended from this role as a result of the indictment. That's also probably the least of his worries as he's also been charged with conspiracy to commit mail fraud and honest services mail fraud and conspiracy to commit money laundering. Additionally, two exam administrators who were bribed to allow him to take the test are also being charged with conspiracy to commit racketeering. Also among the clients who allegedly paid for all of this, you had actress Felicity Huffman. She is said to have paid $15,000 to have one of her daughters receive a 1420 on the SAT. And so she is being charged with conspiracy to commit mail fraud and honest services mail fraud. However, her husband, actor William H. Macy, who knew about the bribes via a phone call, according to the indictment, is not being charged. Although before we jump into more names, we should jump into the fake athletics recruiting. While college coaches don't get to single-handedly admit students into schools, they can eye particular students as potential recruits, which has a great influence on their admission. So Singer would bribe college coaches to, quote, designate applicants as purported athletic recruits, regardless of their athletic ability. So basically, you'd have these coaches telling admissions the client's children, they're all-star athletes, they're very important, even though they didn't play the sport in question. Singer even reportedly would take stock photos of someone playing a sport and edit the student's face onto the photo to make it look like they were an athlete. And at this point, you hear that and you go, well, there's no way the kids didn't know. Well, in a piece from the indictment, which is a conversation between Singer and Elizabeth Kimmel, who is a mother who owns a media company, we see the lanes that some parents went to not only to get their kids into school, but to keep that fact from them. With Elizabeth Kimmel saying, so my son and I just got back from USC orientation. It went great. The only kind of glitch was, and I, he didn't, my son didn't tell me this at the time. But yesterday when he went to meet with his advisor, he stayed after a little bit and the, apparently the advisor said something to the effect of, oh, so you're a track athlete. And my son said, no, cause my son has no idea. And that's what the way we want to keep it. And you know, this aspect of the scandal involves even more big names. You had Lori Lawlin who played Aunt Becky on Full House, her husband Massimo Giannulli, who was a prominent fashion designer paying half a million dollars for their two daughters to be recruited to the crew team at USC, even though neither of their daughters actually rode crew. And also of note here, part of the reason that there has been so much focus on these two daughters isn't just because Aunt Becky, isn't just because of the amount of money, but also because one of their daughters is an influencer and YouTuber by the name of Olivia Jade, who has used her college student status in paid promotions on her Instagram. And to make matters worse for her, people have found a video where she seems incredibly ungrateful for this college experience at USC, which according to these reports, she shouldn't even have. I know that people have pointed out is that back in August, she posted a video where she claimed she didn't care about academics and that she only goes to college for parties. Um, but I do want the experience of like game days, partying, I don't really care about school, as you guys all know. But also back in 2018, before this whole news situation, she did post an apology video. I just genuinely want to say I'm sorry for anyone I've offended by saying that. I know that it's a privilege and it's a blessing and I'm really grateful. But now, of course, many of the comments on both of those videos reference the bribes that got her into USC to begin with. All right, top comments like, you're just a spoiled brat that cheated into college when others had to actually work hard to get in. Can you do a video too about how your parents paid 500K to scam your way into USC? Also how your SAT score and sports profile is fake? And as you can likely tell, one of the big things is that they felt that she stole a spot from a deserving qualified student. Right, people saying it is just another example of ungrateful rich people screwing over your everyday joke. And along with all of this around Olivia Jade, you even have people asking brands to drop their ties with her. And as far as Olivia's reaction to all of this, uh, right now we don't know. She hasn't posted anything to YouTube, Twitter, or Instagram since this whole thing has unfolded. And honestly, given that it is a legal situation, I think that's probably the smartest move. But yeah, it's gonna be very interesting to see how this situation unfolds, what other information comes out. I mean, looking through the evidence for these parents, it is damning. Like the only way some of this could be even more transparently a crime is if they said, yes, I would like to do the crime, please. Yes, that's correct. I'd like two full crimes with the option for a, a third crime on the side. But also I think this situation highlights part of a problem 
problem with college. I mean, in the past, we talked about the legacy issue at colleges. Something that is very briefly mentioned here is the donations to the school, right? That backdoor. Which is such bullshit. I mean, that is very transparently paying so that someone can get in despite whether they were good or bad. And so it kind of appears that people that wanted to take advantage of a busted school system, but on a budget, they're the ones that are getting hit. And understand, I'm not saying what they did is okay. I think that they should be properly punished, but I, I think we need to look at this as a full situation. But that is where I'm gonna end it. Of course, I'd love to know your thoughts on it regarding the, the parents, the kids, or really just the story in general. I'd love to hear from you in those comments down below. And that's where we're going to end today's show. And remember, if you like this video, hit us with a like, share the video. Also, if you're new here, be sure to hit that subscribe button. Definitely click that bell to turn on notifications. Also, if you missed the last Philip DeFranco show or the Extra Morning News Deep Dive, you wanna catch up on those, you can click or tap right there to watch those. But with that said, of course, as always, my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces, and I'll see you tomorrow.